gather around friends. My first story of the evening is the legend of Deadwood Creek. Listen close while I tell you of a place. A place not far from here, where the wind whispers tales of greed and misfortune. Back when I was but a beardless young boy, a group of prospectors struck gold around these parts. As the news spread fast, men with calloused hands and eyes filled with dollar signs came down the valley like zombies fixated on hunger. These men built Deadwood Creek overnight, it was a shantytown of rough-cut timber and dreams wilder than a buck and bronco. The townspeople were led by a man called John Morgan, a powerful man, built like a redwood and meaner than a rattlesnake. He worked his men hard, deeper and deeper into the mountain's belly. You see, Mr. Morgan was the greediest of all the townspeople. Gold nuggets the size of your fist poured out of the mountain, enough to turn a man delirious and forget his own name. But, as you know, there is no gold rush town around here anymore, there is, however, a legend about Deadwood Creek. My grandpa whispered it to me, and warned me never to go near the valley. It's a tale of a sleeping spirit, a guardian of the mountain's riches. Back in the day a widow unassociated with the town, dressed in black with a huge mole on her wrinkly old nose. She tried to tell this legend to Mr. Morgan, she tried to warn him to leave the mountain alone. He wasn't having any nonsense get in the way of his gold, of course. The old hag began her story. Her grandfather, as weathered as an old oak tree, spoke of Deadwood Creek in hushed tones. Not of the gold that lured prospectors to their doom, but of the white buffalo, a spirit older than time itself. The Lakota people believed it guarded the valley's riches, ensuring only those who took with respect were rewarded. But greed, her grandfather warned, was a hungry wolf. He spoke of a miner called Jebediah Thorne, who once scoffed at the legend, one fateful night his pickaxe carved a path of destruction into the heart of the mountain, his eyes fixated on a thick vein of pure gold. Then, with a rumble beneath his feet, the earth roared in protest. A monstrous white buffalo began his galloping charge from the darkness of the mine shaft, its eyes red like burning embers from the depths of hell, emerged from the darkness as the mighty buffalo charged at the greedy miner, the ground swallowed Jebediah and his men. Its unearthly bellow echoed through the valley, a chilling reminder that the mountains hold secrets, and the great spirit protects its own with a fury as fierce as the wind itself. You have been warned Mr. Morgan, greed will be your final undoing, do not disturb the white buffalo. Legends are for fools, he scoffed in return, swinging a glass of whiskey in the air and gulping it down like it was water. Well, as the saying goes, pride comes before a fall, and for Mr. Morgan, his pride would be his final undoing. One moonless night, the earth groaned beneath the feet of the townspeople. A tremor shook the very ground of Deadwood Creek, the entrance to the gold mine collapsed, the screams that emanated from the rubble didn't last long. In his earlier greed Mr. Morgan had commanded his men to dig deeper and deeper, never thinking to dig an emergency shaft. He and half his crew vanished in the blink of an eye that night. The few survivors who did return to the town, came out of the shaft pale-faced and gibbering, young men in their prime looked like they just returned from an apocalypse, they spoke of a monstrous roar and a chilling wind that seemed to come from the belly of the earth itself. Deadwood Creek turned into a ghost town overnight. The fear in those men's eyes was enough to convince everyone else to run back to civilization. Planes were abandoned, cabins left to rot. Some say you can still hear their rusted pickaxes chipping at the mountain, and their dented pans sloshing water, a grim reminder of their greed. Listen closely. Can you hear it? Sometimes, on lonely nights, when the wind howls through the trees, I'll come out to this forest to try and get a glimpse of the trapped souls. Not long ago, my worst fear came true and I heard the echoes of pickaxes digging into nothingness. I saw lights flickering in the distance, I could see the shadows shuffling along the mountain ridge in military style, just like Mr. Morgan had always made them, forever searching for the gold that claimed their lives. So, remember. Let the mountains keep their secrets, for some treasures ain't worth the price. Now, 
Throw another log on the fire, for the night's young, and stories like this need a good warm blaze to keep the evil spirits away. My next tale will chill your blood and send shivers down your spine. It's the story of the White Hand, a legend whispered by those who dare explore forgotten places. Years ago, a group of teenage thrill-seekers, fueled by youthful bravado, ventured into a cave on the other side of this lake. It's a labyrinth of darkness, the air hangs heavy, thick with the smell of damp earth and something else, something unknown, something ancient and unsettling. The cave's deathly silence is broken only by the dripping of unseen water. They were armed with torches, their laughter bounced off the cavern walls, until they reached a narrow passage. One by one, they squeezed through, their bravado fading with each step deeper into the unknown. The air grew colder, the silence heavier. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream shattered the stillness. Panic surged through their frozen bodies before a jolt of reality sent them scrambling back, their torches casting grotesque shadows on the cave's uneven walls. In the frantic scramble, a young woman named Sarah tripped, her torch tumbled and plunged them into utter darkness. A collective fearful gasp filled the air, followed by a strained silence. Then, a whisper, faint yet distinct, echoed through the cavern, help me. This was not something anyone would want to hear in the darkness of a cave. Fear threatened to consume them, but Sarah, with a trembling voice, called out, Where are you? A reply came, closer this time, close enough to feel the chilling cold breath of the their unknown guests on the side of her face. Here, it said, as they strained to see in the suffocating darkness, a clammy hand, bone white and luminous, materialized from the shadows. Five icy fingers grasped at the air, stretched out towards them. Shrieks tore through the darkness as they fumbled for dear life. Their eyes now slightly accustomed to the dark could see a white hand, hanging in mid-air for a horrifying moment before vanishing as abruptly as it appeared. Panic seized them, and they fled the cave, each of the teenagers scrambling to find a steady foot, vowing never to return. One by one, each teenager emerged from the cave into the fresh lakeside air. A quick headcount revealed Sarah was still in the cave. Sarah! They screamed into the cave. Sarah, where are you? But Sarah never replied. The teenagers too scared to rescue her ran as fast as their legs would carry them to the nearest police station, where they retold of their dramatic escape from the unknown icy hand and their missing friend. In the morning light of the next day, the police arrived at the scene. Sarah's parents hysterically crying, awaited a glimmer of hope that would never come. As the rescue team emerged from the cave, their faces black from dirt, revealed there was no trace of anything or anyone in the cave. To this day, Sarah has never been seen again. Some say if you hold your ear close to the lake surface you can still hear her asking. Where are you? But some places hold secrets best left undisturbed. The darkness holds more than just shadows, and sometimes, a helping hand might not be what it seems. Now, let me tell you of a chilling warning that's been whispered through generations called, The Mirror at Midnight. Legend speaks of the witching hour, the stroke of midnight, when the veil between our earthly world and the spirit realm is thinnest. It's a time when the night air crackles with unseen energy, and some things are best to remain hidden. My story begins with a forgotten mansion, shrouded in perpetual twilight. Emily, a woman with a morbid curiosity for all things supernatural, inherited this mansion and all the dusty heirlooms within, including a full-length mirror swathed in cobwebs, its surface dull and clouded. Unlike the other objects, this mirror held a palpable sense of something that could only be described as wrong. Old diaries hinted at its dark history, filled with frantic scribblings of reflections that mirrored not your own face, but something else. Something hungry. 
Emily believed superstitions were for the weak-minded. Yet, she knew not to scoff at them, just in case. One moonless night, alone in her new home, surrounded by all these dusty objects from the past life of a distant relative, a morbid fascination gnawed at her when the clock tower chimed eleven. The foggy air pressed down on the house. Emily, with her heart pounding against her ribs, crept through the mansion's silent rooms until finally, she reached the study where the mirror stood, covered in an old tablecloth. As she pulled it away, the final chime echoed, resonating through her very bones. It was already midnight, where had the last hour gone? She wondered to herself as she peered into the mirror's depths, no reflection greeted her. Just a swirling vortex of darkness, churning with an unnatural energy. As the chimes faded, Emily, compelled by a morbid curiosity, leaned in closer, the reflection in the void coalescing into a face, a grotesque caricature of her own. Its eyes were like pits of burning ember, they locked onto hers, trapping her with its otherworldly gaze. A skeletal hand, long and impossibly thin, shot from the vortex, reaching for her with a speed that defied nature. Its bony fingers manically scratched against the cold glass from the other side, the sound was like nails on a chalkboard, sending shivers down her spine. A horrifying screech erupted from the mirror, a sound that ripped through the silence of the night, clawing at Emily's sanity. Panic surged. Emily stumbled back, knocking over a dusty candelabra. Flames suddenly erupted, casting monstrous shadows on the walls. The creature in the mirror lunged toward her with manic speed, its skeletal fingers finally breaking through the glass, sending shards flying and grasping at her arm, leaving behind the imprint of nails clawing at her flesh. It was searing cold, like nothing she had ever felt before. She wanted to scream but like a terrifying nightmare, nothing came out. Emily fled the room, as she ran for her life, the flames enveloping the mansion behind her. She ran throughout the night, as far as her legs would carry her, never looking back, never stopping for fear of what might be behind her. As dawn broke, it painted the sky a sickly orange as she collapsed, gasping for breath. The chilling touch lingered, she didn't know what she saw but she could feel its presence. The mansion burned to the ground, the cursed mirror reduced to molten slag. But as the flames died down, a single skeletal figure rose from the ashes. Its fingers twitched, ever reaching, ever searching. The mirror may have been shattered, but the creature within was free. And who knows where it might be lurking now. Perhaps it's closer than you think. I know of a chilling local legend, a tale whispered by weathered fishermen and passed down through generations, the lullaby of lost souls. I hope you're sitting comfortably, because this next one is anything but comfortable. Years ago, on this very lake, a young woman named Amelia drowned during a summer storm. Her screams were said to have echoed across the water, swallowed by the hungry darkness. But that wasn't the end of her story. Legend has it that on nights when the moon is full and the lake lies still like a mirror, Amelia's spirit returns. If you ever hear a faint melody, or a haunting lullaby carried on the breeze, you'd better run. It's a sweet, mournful song that tugs at your heartstrings, a melody that will lull you into a false sense of security. But, don't be fooled. As I mentioned earlier, this isn't a song of comfort, it's a siren call. If you're brave enough, or foolish enough, to get closer to the source, the melody grows louder, more insistent, more persuasive. It'll wrap around you like a spectral fog, blurring your vision and dulling your senses. Then, you see her. Amelia, beautiful and pale, with hair like seaweed and eyes that glow with an unnatural light. She sings her lullaby, her voice filled with a heartbreaking sorrow. But something is terribly wrong. 
Her skin is deathly white, and her smile. That smile is more like a fixed, unnatural grin, a permanent scream trapped on her face. But, heed my warning. If you get too close, if the lullaby fully envelops you, you're lost. You see, those aren't tears streaking down Amelia's face. Oh no, it's the souls of those she's lured to their deaths. They become part of her mournful song, forever trapped in their watery tomb. One old fisherman claimed to have seen Amelia on a particularly still night. He said he heard the lullaby, felt himself drawn towards it, but remembered the legend. As the song grew louder, he saw her spectral form in the distance, but he fought the urge to get closer. He turned his boat around and sped away as fast as his little outboard motor would take him, the melody echoing in his ears to this day. He has never set foot on the lake again since. You might be asking yourself, who is Amelia, and how did her spirit end up trapped on the lake? Well, that's a story of love and passion, gone awry. You see, Amelia wasn't always a vengeful spirit. She was a young woman deeply in love with a local fisherman named Thomas. They planned to marry, but on the eve of their wedding, a storm raged across the lake. Thomas, being a skilled fisherman, felt compelled to help a fellow villager whose boat was caught in the storm. Amelia, desperate and heartbroken, raced to the shore, pleading with the storm to bring Thomas back safely. In her grief and despair, she made a reckless pact, she offered her own soul in exchange for Thomas's safe return. The storm subsided, and Thomas returned unharmed. But Amelia was gone, vanished beneath the churning water. Stricken with guilt, Thomas searched for her body, but it was never to be found. Amelia's spirit, bound by her pact, became trapped on the lake. Her love for Thomas twisted into a chilling obsession. The lullaby she sings is a warped version of the song they used to sing together, a song that now lures unsuspecting souls to their watery deaths. It's been said, the only way to release her tortured soul is if she can lure Thomas back to the lake, where they can spend an eternity together. But Thomas died decades ago, each life she claims leaves a sting, because it's not her soulmate. As she grows more mournful with each passing season, her wails become louder and more irresistible to the ear. So, the next time you find yourself on a lonely lake at night, especially under a full moon, and you hear a faint, haunting melody, don't listen. Turn and run, because the lullaby of lost souls is a song you never want to hear the end of. You know, I may be reaching my golden years and, in general, life has been good to me. But it wasn't always this way. You see when I was a young boy, our school took us on an overnight camp. We were due to learn about basic survival skills. Building fires, shelters, teamwork, that kind of thing. Well, the park ranger warned us to make sure our campfire was extinguished before we went to sleep. We assumed it was to avoid forest fires, or animal safety, the usual park ranger type advice. As the good young people we were turning into, we fully obliged and made sure before we zipped up our tents, that the campfire was fully extinguished. All was well until one greedy little boy decided he wanted one last round of toasted marshmallows for breakfast the next day. The adults were unaware of our secret feast that morning and as we packed up to go home, I guess, everyone just assumed someone else would extinguish the campfire. It wasn't long into our bus ride home that a thick black smoke was visible in the distance. Soon, forest fire flames were chasing us down the road. The driver, clearly speeding in an attempt to escape, took a wrong turn and without any warning or notice, our little yellow bus was flying over the edge of a cliff. 
Everyone died that day, well, everyone, except for me of course. I told myself, it was a horrible accident. It wasn't until years later that I connected the dots of the park ranger's warning and the tragic demise of my entire class. I came to think, who was that park ranger? Do you know, with all the research I did, I could never find one shred of evidence that the local government ever employed a park ranger in this area. Years later, the prophecy was fulfilled again and now I'm convinced it's my duty to warn you tonight. To make sure you put the damn fire out before you retire to your tent for the evening. Don't ever let those red embers fester. Let me tell you a story about this forest, a story etched in the very soul of these trees. A crackling fire, much like the one before us now, cast a warm glow on the faces of three brothers, Mark, Tom, and David. Laughter echoed through the clearing as their families, a boisterous mix of wives, kids, and grandkids, roasted marshmallows and told stories. This annual reunion was a tradition, a time to reconnect and escape the city's hustle. As the weekend drew to a close, a familiar sadness settled over them. The last embers of the campfire flickered, much like their fading joy. Tom, the youngest, stretched. All right, everyone, time to pack up. We have a long drive ahead. One by one, the three families loaded their cars, the cheerful chatter replaced by the clinking of luggage and tired goodbyes. In the rush to leave, a crucial detail was overlooked. The fire pit, nestled amongst the trees, remained smoldering, a bed of red-hot embers hidden beneath a layer of ash. Uncle George, the family elder, known for his love of local legends, cleared his throat. Remember the tale of Whispering Pines, boys? He asked his nephews. Mark scoffed. Come on Uncle George, not that ghost story again. Bunch of kids messing around, probably started the fire themselves. Maybe, his uncle conceded. But they just wanted some more snacks, but that damn fire was a sleeper. In the eyes of school children, I am sure it looked like it was dead and safe, but they didn't extinguish it. Whispers followed the school kids all the way home, getting louder with each mile. He paused, his gaze flickering to the seemingly innocent campfire they assumed was dead. But they never made it home. Tom chuckled nervously. Sounds like a cautionary tale for bad campers, not for responsible families like us. With their goodbyes exchanged, the three families piled into their cars, each headed different directions, back to their own worlds, the red embers forgotten. On the road, darkness settled, and the miles stretched before them. Mark, driving with his wife in the passenger seat, felt a strange unease. In the rearview mirror, he could have sworn he saw flickering shadows dancing in the darkness behind his car, but he brushed it off as just tired eyes. Suddenly, the radio sputtered and died. The car lurched, the engine coughing to a smoky stop. Panic surged as the headlights flickered and died, plunging them into an inky blackness. An unnatural silence descended, broken only by his wife's shaky breaths. Then, from the darkness surrounding their car, whispers started. Faint at first, they grew louder, a chorus of disembodied voices swirling around them. The whispers spoke of their forgotten fire and a debt to be paid. Fear choked Mark's voice. He fumbled for his phone, but it was dead. The whispers grew insistent, turning into chilling shrieks as shadowy figures materialized in the darkness, their faces obscured by the gloom. The same fate befell Tom and David, their happy drives home morphing into a terrifying journey. Whispers turned to screams, whispers of the neglected fire, whispers of a broken promise, promises of their impending doom. How is it possible? Three families traveling in their individual cars, driving in different directions, all hearing the same whispers and warnings. Well, that's for you to decide. By this point, each family was stranded on the roadside, no functioning cars, no way to charge their phones, no way to seek help. One by one, they would all meet their demise. 
Panic seized Mark, the eldest brother, as the whispers morphed into chilling screams. His wife, pale and trembling, mirrored his fear. As the children began to stir from their sleep, the car lurched forward into the road, the steering wheel locking up, almost like the car was possessed. As the whispers morphed into a manic cackle, bright headlights appeared in the distance, a truck was bearing down on them. Mark screamed, but it was too late. The screech of metal on metal drowned out the final, triumphant roar of the whispers as darkness consumed them entirely. For not only was the truck speeding, but it was also carrying a tank of highly flammable liquid, they never stood a chance. Tom, the middle brother, drove with his teenage son beside him. The whispers started subtly, a background hum that sent shivers down Tom's spine, just like his brother, he dismissed it as fatigue, but the whispers grew stronger, louder, more intense, more sinister, weaving a tale of his neglect at the fire pit. The car began to sputter, losing power as they climbed a steep mountain road. The whispers, now a cacophony of voices filled with malice. Tom fought to control the car as the engine coughed and died. They were on a precarious downhill slope, the whispers morphing into a chilling chorus urging them on. Tom screamed, his son clinging to him in terror. The car picked up speed, on its own accord, careening wildly off the cliff's edge and down the mountainside. The whispers reached a fever pitch as the car hurtled towards the ground deep below them in the valley, a horrifying spectacle of twisted metal and shattered glass playing out against the backdrop of a blood-red moon. Again, just like his brother's family, everyone in the car would meet their demise. Never to be seen again, no body was ever recovered from the wreck. David. The youngest, was the only one awake in his car, a heavy silence pressed down on him. The whispers were chasing their next victim with their mournful sigh, accusing him of his role in the neglected fire. He slammed his fist on the steering wheel, trying to drown them out, but they persisted, growing louder with each passing mile. Without warning a deer was stood in the middle of the road. David's car swerved to avoid it and crashed into a large boulder on a deserted country road. He was enveloped in an unnatural darkness, not a light, nor a living being could be seen anywhere in the distance, his car a wreck and his phone dead. No way to get help for his injured family, all of whom appeared to be slipping off quietly into the next world. The whispers began swirling around him, a chilling embrace. He saw the shadowy figures emerging from the darkness, their faces obscured. The whispers turned into demanding screams, a horrifying symphony of vengeance. The figures closed in, their touch, cold like ice. David screamed, a primal cry of terror lost in the vast emptiness. The whispers reached a deafening crescendo, then silence. Only the faint glow of David's lifeless eyes remained blood pouring from his ears as he fell to the ground like a sack of potatoes. By now an entire extended family, their children and grandchildren wiped from the face of the earth, not a single survivor. You see, the whispers are more than just a haunting. They're a gateway. Those red embers, left unattended, become a beacon for something far more sinister a malevolent entity from the deep depths of the underworld that feeds on forgotten flames and broken promises. So, tonight before we depart, remember the whispers of Whispering Pines, remember my warning. Extinguish the fire completely. Respect the fire, for the line between warmth and malevolence can be as thin as a single, neglected ember.
Oh, there's a chill in the air tonight, huh? Makes the fire crackle a little fiercer, don't you think? That reminds me of a story, a chilling tale whispered by the wind itself, about a lost camper and the unsettling silence of a dark cave. They say, sometimes the wind carries not just stories, but warnings. This particular tale speaks of a young explorer named John, who ventured a little too far on a solo summer trek. He set out with a backpack full of supplies, a heart filled with ambition, and a map he swore by. But as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long, menacing shadows through the towering trees, a jolt of fear ripped through John. He was completely and utterly lost. Panic nodded at him, but John, ever resourceful, tried to maintain his composure. He remembered the advice, stick to high ground if you're disoriented. It'll give you a better view. So, John pushed on, hoping to find a familiar landmark. Hours melted into an endless night. The forest grew denser, the air heavy with the scent of damp earth and decaying leaves. Every rustle in the undergrowth, every snap of a twig, sent shivers down his spine. The wind seemed to mock him, howling through the trees. Whilst taking a moment to rest his weary legs, he could feel an odd pocket of warm air against the back of his neck. It was noticeable compared to the cold evening air of the forest. Suddenly, a monstrous shape emerged from the dense foliage behind him. A bear. Its fur matted and its eyes glowing with hunger, rose on its hind legs. John's heart hammered against his ribs. He remembered the map's warnings about bear activity in the area. But before he could react, the beast charged towards him. The attack was a blur of adrenaline and terror. John fended off the bear with his backpack the weight of his supplies offering a slight advantage. But the bear's raw power was relentless. It ripped through his backpacks, scattering his supplies. Fueled by fear, he managed to land a lucky blow, sending the beast staggering back with a roar. Seizing his chance, he scrambled to his feet and bolted. The enraged bear lumbered after him, its guttural roars echoing through the forest, the ground vibrating with the heavy thumps of its stride. John pushed himself to his limits, his lungs burning, his legs screaming in protest. He could feel the bear gaining on him. Was he hot from running or was that the bear's breath again? Just as despair threatened to consume him, he spotted a dark opening in the distance, a cave, his only hope for refuge. With a burst of renewed energy, he scrambled towards it. The bear's roar was his only encouragement. As he scrambled inside, the cool darkness engulfed him like a suffocating cloak. Silence. A heavy, oppressive silence, broken only by his ragged breaths. Fumbling for his lighter, his fingers brushed against the cold stone walls. A flicker, a spark, then a small torch cast its meager light around the cavern. His confidence, once unshakable, crumbled. His empty stomach gnawed, a reminder of the bear encounter that had ripped his backpack to shreds earlier. He'd managed to scare the beast off, but the experience left him shaken and ill-equipped to survive the cold night. Suddenly, a towering silhouette emerged from the darkness. Another monstrous bear, even larger than before, rose on its hind legs, its eyes reflecting a predatory glint as it towered over him. John's scream died in his throat. He remembered the warm breath on his neck just before the attack. John froze and his blood ran cold when his eyes settled on three pairs of glowing eyes in the corner of the cave, reflecting his faint torchlight. At this point he knew he was outnumbered. A family of bears. Cubs, huddled together, the beast looming over him must be their mother. Were these the first bear's kin? Had he stumbled into their den? John didn't wait to find out. Panic surged through him once more. He dropped the torch, the meager light dying. A blood-curdling scream ripped through the silence. Then, nothing. Followed by, silence. Years later, a search party stumbled upon John's belongings scattered near the cave entrance, his backpack, ripped to shreds, and a dented iPhone. The phone, miraculously intact, held a single video. A shaky recording of John, running towards the cave in a desperate bid for escape, 
The video captured the moment he saw the mother bear looming over him before he dropped it to the ground and the camera also settled on the cub's glowing eyes. The black screen was interrupted with the wails and screams of a man being torn from limb to limb. No trace of John's body was ever found. Only the tattered remains of blood-soaked clothing, a chilling testament to the dangers that lurk in the darkness. So next time you feel a pocket of warm air on a cold night, don't contemplate it for too long. It might just be a hungry bear looking for a meaty snack. Seeing as we are talking about warnings whispered on the breeze, let me tell you about the Banshee, or the Wailing Woman, from ancient Irish mythology. Her mournful howl is carried on the wind, a sound that chills you to the bone. But only if you have Irish blood in your veins. They say it's the cry of the Banshee, a creature born of sorrow, forever seeking the souls of the soon-to-be dead. My next story is one of a young woman named Moira, a fiery spirit with a mane of luscious red hair and a laugh that could chase away the darkest night. She lived a simple life in a small village nestled amongst the rolling green hills of the Irish countryside. One crisp autumn evening, as the leaves rustled in the wind, a shadow fell upon Moira's heart. Her beloved fiancé, Liam, a strong and handsome young farmer, announced he was leaving for the distant city to seek his fortune. Moira's heart ached, but she masked it with a brave smile. She saw him off, waving goodbye as he disappeared down the dusty road. Days turned into weeks, and weeks into months. Letters from Liam became scarce, then ceased altogether. Worry gnawed at Moira, her smile fading with each passing day, her warm laugh slowly dying on her lips. One stormy night, the wind howled. Lightning split the sky, casting momentary shadows on the village walls. Suddenly, a lone figure appeared on the rain-slicked road, a tattered cloak clinging to his shivering skeletal form. It was Liam, pale and gaunt, his eyes filled with a haunted despair. He stumbled towards Moira's cottage, his voice hoarse as he spoke of a terrible accident, of a plague that ravaged the city, and of his desperate journey home. But as he reached for Moira's hand, a gasp escaped her lips. A chilling realization dawned on her face. Liam was dead. His hand was just bone held together with a thin strip of pale skin. His spirit lost and clinging to the mortal realm by a mere thread. Moira's heart shattered. The grief that had simmered for months erupted in a wail that pierced the night sky. The wind seemed to pick it up, carrying her mournful lament across the valley. But as her wail resonated with the storm, something extraordinary happened. A bolt of lightning, fused with otherworldly energy, struck Moira. The otherworldly energy crackled through her, warping her spirit and transforming her breathtaking form into a spectral manifestation of her eternal grief. Her once joyful laugh contorted into a chilling, unearthly shriek. That night, the villagers awoke to an unsettling silence. Moira was gone, and in her place, a legend was born. The wind still whispers her name, a mournful lullaby for the departed. But now, it's a sound that chills the soul, a harbinger of death for those with Irish blood. The Banshee's wail is a haunting melody, a double-edged sword. It serves as a farewell song for the departing soul as it embarks on its journey to the afterlife. Yet, it's a sound steeped in dread, a harbinger of death. It pierces the night, a mournful premonition, a death knell carried on the wind, a warning that a loved one's time on earth is at its end. So, the next time you hear the wind howl, especially if you have Irish ancestry, listen closely. It might just be the banshee, forever searching for her lost love. Her cry is a chilling reminder that a loved one's time is near. But perhaps, within the terror, there's a sliver of kindness. The Banshee's wail may be a grim herald, but it's also a desperate plea for final goodbyes. Remember, 
Moira's final vision of Liam, his skeletal hand reaching out, a chilling reminder of a soul trapped, unable to move on without a proper farewell. The Banshee's wail, though terrifying, might just be a shield, a way to spare you the sight of such a heartbreaking scene.